Let, let's see if we can get Brian to help uh, Chuck out. Apologize, we have a little, a technical, a little bit of technical difficulty. One of, one of our board members, uh, he just went around the corner, Lynn. And so we'll uh, ask for a little bit of grace before we start here so we can get Chuck Weiss on. Can you hear me? Okay, Chuck. Yeah, you're good. We're good. Yeah, he finally was acknowledged. So thank you so much. Well, I appreciate your patience. Uh, welcome to the April 13th uh, board meeting. We've got uh, three various meetings. We'll begin with a public hearing. Uh, that'll start here at 5.06 p.m. And uh, board members, welcome. Good to see you. And let's go ahead and start with a roll call. Someone start me off. Sandra Kidman. Thank you. Desiree Fowler. Dee McCary. Thank you, Dee. Desiree Fowler. Thanks, Board Desiree. Board. Chuck Weiss. And I'm Bob Candelari, President of the Board. And uh, Superintendent Wallen, please introduce yourself, sir. There we go, right here. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, thank you. And we're joined by Lynn Hoffman, the Executive Secretary of the Board and uh, the superintendent. All right, so we're gonna start off this evening with a, with a uh, public hearing. And the first item of business is a presentation of the budget revision. Uh, it's number two to the annual expenditure budget for the 2020-2021 school year. And we are joined by Vindi Rahande. And thank you, Vindi. Good evening, thank you, sir. Governing Board President, Mr. Candelaria. Governing Board members, Superintendent Wallen. Today, we're going to be looking at um, our budget revision to, for fiscal year 21. Let me share my screen with you. Okay. Here today, I'm showing you what our budget limit, how our budget limit has changed in comparison to our revision one. You'll see that we have a decrease of about, of about 868,000. This is mainly because of a reduction in our uh, revenue control limit. And in the next section, I'm showing you what this, why this reduction happened. So here I wanted um, to highlight that because of the reduction in due to ADM loss, our cost uh, was $1.3 million. And um, distance learning decrease, percent, percentage decrease is about 635,000. And um, this that's close to about $2 million um, because we received um, our, the enrollment stabilization grant of about $1 million. This helped reduce um, this reduction. And also the, from revision one to revision two, we had a little bit of an increase in our budget balance carries forward of 17,000. And that all shows you at the end how the reduction um, was calculated. In the next section, you can see how, what our distribution looks like and how we have uh, our salaries, benefits, um, purchase services, supplies, and other items are, uh, divvied up as budgeted out uh, for our new budget limit of $16.7 million. Here, I, I'm showing you your, the pie chart that you like to see that shows us about 74% of our MNO budget is dedicated towards salaries and benefits. Then we have our impact aid budget from in comparison to uh, revision one, it went up a, a little bit. Uh, that's due to some uh, interest we've accumulated on our revenue. 
and here on our um, impact aid budget distribution, it you will see that about 40%, sorry, about 50% of our um, impact aid budget is dedicated towards salaries and benefits. Here we have the district additional assistance, our uh, DAR limit through MNO, we had an increase of about $727. In our classroom site fund, you'll see our available budget this year is about $2.8 million and our estimated expenses are about $1 million and our ending cash balance would be about $1.4 million. Under our special projects, we, as usual, we have our federal projects, um, the Title I, IIs, and the IDEA Basic uh, grants. They're about $2.5 million. And also on uh, page six, we are able to highlight our federal projects uh, or the COVID related um, funds, uh, which are our SL1, II, III, and, and Normal Stabilization Grant. Um, SL3 is an estimate at this point of about $5 million. Altogether, the budget we have for our COVID-related um, funds are $8.5 million. And our state projects at, is at about $34,000. Our food service is about $1.4 million. And our CTE budget is about uh, $620,000. That brings us to an end, if you have any questions for me. Thank you, Vindy. And again, just to remind me, um, the bubble money that we always talk about that'll be here for what, uh, tell me, re remind me how long that'll be with us? 2024. So 2024, and that's the federal projects uh, types monies? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so yes. all right. Oh, very good. And we're keeping a very strict accountability of that, correct? Correct. All right, good. Because at some point in time, you just want that, uh, you know, kind of detailed a little bit more, right? Yes. yes. Okay. That for you. Thank you so much. Any other questions, board members? Okay, thank you, Vindy. Appreciate that. Thank uh, you. Oh, my gosh. Did I turn myself off? No, I'm good. Uh, so that's the uh, end of our public hearing. Uh, and we're going to go to item B, public comments. We have none. Is that correct, Lynn? We're going to put those into our, our regular meeting. So I just want to make sure I'm not passing over something. So we're good. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to the end of our public uh, hearing. And I'll need a motion to adjourn. Motion. D, I think you're making a motion to adjourn. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. We've got a motion from D. I second that motion. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and move to our regular board meeting. And that'll commence at 5.13 p.m. Uh, and just a note that... Uh, in lieu of our public comments, uh, because of our virtual environment, uh, we do ask people to send comments to comments at pageud.org no later than Monday by 5 p.m. Uh, before each regular meeting. We'll review those and, and uh, read those as, as, as necessary as can. We'll remind you that the comments, uh, that's one thing special for each board, board to decide whether they will or will not hear. We have decided to hear those things. And uh, in normal times, we'd give them three minutes. Um, but like I said, uh, if you have though, if you have comments, it's comments at pageud.org, no later than Monday by 5 p.m. the day before a regular meeting. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to call this uh, meeting to order, as I said, 5.14 p.m. And let's go ahead and uh, repeat the roll call, please, in the order that you did last time, <laughs> if you can remember. <laughs> How's that? Sandra Kidman. Thank you. Dean McCary. Great. Who was third? Desiree, Desiree oh. Fowler. She, yeah, Dave, Desiree Fowler, board clerk. Oh, thank you very much. Chuck Weiss. 
And Bob Candler, board president and superintendent Wallen, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Larry yeah. Wallen, Thank you. Thank, Good to see you. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Lynn Hoffman, join us, executive secretary of the board and uh, for the superintendent as well. So again, uh, I'd like for you to, to uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'll say that as we stand up and we have a flag in the boardroom. Board members, please face that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, the uh, I would ask you now to join me in a moment of silent meditation. Okay, thank you very much. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. I'll need a motion and a second uh, to proceed. A motion. I make a motion to approve the agenda. I second that motion to approve the agenda. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item uh, is announcements and comments. Would you please read the statement, please, Des? For comments, right? Yes. Okay, give me just a second. Let me log in. It's all the way at the bottom. Sorry. You're good. Okay, so it says public com complaints concerning facilities, service personnel, and instruction are not heard by the board until the district's due process procedures are followed. Forms for filing complaints are available at the superintendent's office. To address the board, please fill out a blue card and give to the superintendent. The board reserves the right to limit public comments due to time restriction. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And as we mentioned up top, we've uh, found a different way to do it in, in lieu of the fact that we are virtual. So I do have uh, several comments uh, that I, let me acknowledge first because the comments that I have are, we have several of them and they will address this much the same issue. And uh, so I will acknowledge the folks that have, have said them specifically or have sent them to us, Karen Steele. Um, and then there's Christy Newborn Gutierrez. Uh, and then uh, I've got uh, one from uh, Josh Brink. And appreciate your comments, folks. And for Josh Brink, we've got a list of uh, about 17 teachers, and uh, that the email is sent, uh, rec recognized as being sent on behalf of the teachers listed below. So what I'm going to do, because of the nature of this, and we do this often, if there's much the same topic, we'll acknowledge that. And so they are. And, and so I, I will say that the comments are really regarding resignations uh, that we have seen. Uh, and some point out, like we haven't seen before, uh, I know there's a couple of us that were on the board when uh, we, um, one of the main issues with the new superintendent coming on board was to, to really work on retention because we were losing so many teachers. And um, so that is really an issue that we're all concerned about and that we're intimately involved with because uh, we're all tied into this district. We, we're a community. Uh, the people that we have, we really uh, uh, appreciate and appreciate the, the things they're doing. I know on that list uh, are several folks that are leaving for personal reasons. Um, I've talked to s several of them myself. And uh, again, uh, the one thing that we're, we will continually do is to have dialogue with the superintendent concerning retention, concerning resignations, and concerning the causes of those resignations. So I wanted to assure you that uh, we aren't operating in the dark. And so, uh, again, I appreciate all your comments. And to Josh Brink and the teachers, uh, appreciate your statements. Uh, and 
we're all in the midst of what we have been calling a unique year for sure. And J Joshua indicated, well, it's not an excuse for not having open communication. And uh, one thing you had suggested that I think we'll really work at, and that is to uh, really develop an open forum with teachers. If we, if you give us latitude to to do that in the coming in the coming weeks or or within a few weeks coming. So we'd like to do that. Thank you for the, the uh, uh, suggestion for that because you, uh, I think right we say it's really tough when you don't get to see people. And at this point, having everything virtual, we'll find a way to do that maybe in a bigger environment and those kind of things. But um, again, I, I appreciate one thing you said, healing. We all need healing during this time period. And I know you've acknowledged and, and some people have acknowledged the fact that uh, staff has gotten attention when it comes to um, how's your how's your health? How are your all of all of you? How are you doing emotionally and those kind of things? And we do have to be concerned about those things. But in addition to that, with the COVID and with all of the things that have been going on, uh, we do want to be open uh, to your comments. So I, I'll summarize those with that and leave it there. But again, I appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Christy Gutierrez, I mean, born here, attended from kinder through 12th grade, and I appreciate you guys being uh, concerned enough to write and to be involved, and also Karen uh, and Haas, thank you so much. So those are our comments, and with that, uh, we'll uh, go on to recognition of employees of the month, and Sandra Kidman, you've got that. All right, can you hear me? There you are. Okay, thank you. All right, I get the special pleasure of reading the Employees of the Month, which is always one of my um, things I enjoy the most. Okay, the first um, recipient is the Certified Pride recipient, Anna Wold, math teacher at Page High School, nominated by Megan Moore, math teacher at Page High School as well. Since Anna arrived at Page High School, she has worked tirelessly to make sure our students receive the math education they deserve. She does a lot of work with the Navajo math circles to make math relevant and fun for students. She actively attends ADE workshops to bring back information to the math team. During the pandemic, she continues to show her students compassion while holding them to high expectations. She has seen great results on her common formative data and serves as a leader in the Algebra 2 team. Anna often reminds us all to be kind to ourselves during these difficult times. She's someone I look to for advice and friendship, and I'm so grateful to have her on our team. Here are some quotes from her students. She was and continues to be helpful, optimistic, open-minded, and overall keeps a positive classroom. She also has the corniest little math memes presented almost every day that make everyone in our class laugh a little by Sarah Fowler. She is always willing to help me with any assignments late or otherwise. Oh, Dora, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't say that name. Help me out. I don't want to slaughter the name, huh? Dene Hashki Green. Sorry, I just know my name gets slaughtered too and I hate it when other people do it. So I don't want to do the same thing. Anyway, um, a cheerful teacher always asks how I'm doing and is very helpful, Dustin Yazi. Fun, fun class and bright personality tries her best for her students, Adele Synergeny. Ms. Wold understands her students as kids who are working and doing other classrooms assignments to pass. She gives us students time to work on our assignments. She gives us feedback back in a way that we all understand. She holds break rooms and helps students improve their grade by helping them and telling them step by step. She gives us time to interact with each other. She doesn't get upset when we're chatting in the chat box. She understands that her students are also still kids and it seems like she enjoys that. Also, she doesn't hand out like 20 assignments each week. Week She gives us our assignments and that we, she knows we can handle serenity limum. So congratulations. Sounds like a math teacher we all would love to have. Thank you. Now to the classified pride recipient, Serafina Adson, registrar at the Page Middle School. And she was nominated by Armenia Tempeni, our ELL gifted and gifted coordinator. All right, Serafina demonstrates pride every day. She greets staff and students with a smile. 
and is willing to help. She asks questions to gain further understanding when she's uncertain of a task or request. She's proactive in getting paperwork taken care of and thorough by ensuring all parts of documents are completed upon acceptance. Sarah is also very approachable and willing to problem solve with others. She's able to see the big picture and get things done to support other programs. It has been a pleasure to see Sarah jump right into her position and get things done in order and learn quickly how to be part of the team. Serafina has excelled at getting students registered accurately and with all the necessary documents completed. She has also excelled at collaboration, making sure she understands the why and how behind what is done so she can better be a better, so to be better in her position. So congratulations. Um, we got to have good support staff to help our students and move everything. So thank you very much and congratulations. And I'd like to just add my congratulations too. Congratulations, Anna and uh, Serafina. Continue the great work and, and great words that your, not only your students, but the, your peers have brought before us. So thank you so much. Appreciate that. And I've got the great honor of enthusiastically recognizing our Page Unified School District Student of the Month. And we're gonna start with Lakeview Primary, Gregory Smith. Hey, Gregory was nominated by his first grade teacher, Julia Redman. And because he wasn't transferred into my class, he was less than thrilled. Julia, meeting a whole new teacher in a whole new class a quarter of the way through the year can be a scary thing. Luckily, Gregory made the transition easy with his great attitude. Gregory has shown so much growth academically and socially. He shows pride every day and is especially good at walking quietly in the hallway. I often use him as an example for his classmates when they need a reminder of hallway pride. Gregory also, also shows pride when playing on the playground. Everyone wants to be his friend because he is kind and fun. I'm so thankful to have Gregory in my classroom. Gregory, you are the student of the month at Lakeview Primary. Congratulations. Remind all your classrooms how awesome you are. I mean, all your, all your students, fellow students, and Julia Redmond sure thinks a lot about you. Going to Desert View Intermediate, Joshua Sinegeni. Joshua is nominated by his third grade teacher, Natalie Russell, because he has really adapted to, to virtual learning, which we all know has been challenged. He shows pride by participating and being actively involved in class. He has improved his grades from first semester and continues to grow each day. Nice job, Joshua. I'm glad you're part of our class. And Joshua, we're glad you're part of Page Unified School District. Keep up the great work. And now from middle school, the uh, student of the month is writer. And I'm going to, uh, I say Simeka or Simeka. I probably messed that up, and I am so sorry. A writer was nominated by Sharon Watson because this young man was so helpful uh, to me during testing time. Above and beyond to help by offering to help was super patient and gave me little tips here and there. In in general, he's just a very kind, polite uh, young man. Doesn't have any behavior concerns. Very confident. So friendly with all students and staff. He is very professionally dressed and does all he can to be an exceptional student. I really enjoy his presence in our school. Ryder, great job. And they're gonna look forward to having you up at the Page High School. In Page High School, student of the month, Brian George. Brian was nominated by Mrs. Monica Gaylor because uh, he comes remotely every day to class and is there paying attention, participating in the chat box and always turns in his work. He is also very helpful anytime his teacher needs assistance. Brian is highly motivated to do well in school and people can turn to him for a positive response. He is also good at striking up interesting conversations. He is on the high honors list with a 3.5 GPA and has perfect attendance for the second semester. Brian, hey, you're getting it done in the virtual environment. Way to go. Thanks for leading the way. Manson Mesa High School, uh, the student of the month, Alicia Willie. Alicia was nominated by her teacher, Corey Fitch, because she has shown a lot of motivation lately. She attends school regularly. She's gotten her credit up to date in ELA, and so she is ready for her junior year. Alicia is polite and focused on her academics as we return back to school. I appreciate her willingness to start making up her credit 
and stay on track to graduate on time. And Alicia, I just want to give you a special shout out. We know each other. And uh, man, uh, there are some people that have mountains in front of them to climb and you are a mountain climber. Congratulations on your accomplishment to this point. Hey, and finish it up strong. Thanks so much, Alicia. And then from Sage and Sand Virtual Academy, we have Lacey Espinosa. Lacey is a senior at SSVA and was nominated by Jeremy Poole because she is consistent and works hard in Sage and Sand Virtual Academy, which has kept her on track to graduate this May. Lacey's effort has kept her grades in good standing all year and has already got acceptance letters from colleges for next year. Lacey has been an exemplary student in Sage and Sand and has shown great focus in the virtual environment. Lacey Espinosa, thank you so much for staying, uh, staying strong in this whole thing and keeping focus. All right, those are our students of the month. Thank you so much for those that have nominated and all uh, you do students of month for what, for what we're about here at Page Unified School District. Okay, uh, done with that. We're gonna go, we're gonna head and move on to item number C and that's uh, the COVID responses part three. Uh, and this is Jeannie Wood and it's just for information only. So Jamie. Good evening, let me share my screen, please. Um, Mr. Candelaria, oh, yep, we can see it. Okay, Governing Board President Candelaria, Superintendent Wallen, Governing Board members, good evening. This will be part three of a presentation that began in a February uh, board meeting. Part one, I would consider a 45,000 foot view of where we are with spending. We had two building directors join during that conversation. Art Marquez spoke to us about addressing food insecurity within our district. And Tashina Williams spoke to us about social emotional well being within our students. Part two of the presentation was last month during a study board session. And I would consider that a 30,000 foot view of information given. And we broke down a little bit more the timeline associated with that. Part three will be very similar to both presentations. We can consider that maybe a 20,000 foot view, still high level information that I will be sharing today. The graphics that I'm presenting most are not my own. They come from two different um, learnings that were made available recently. One is an ASA webinar that was given. And the second is an ADE strategic funding town hall meeting uh, that I was part of. There have been three acts associated with COVID response. The first is the CARES Act, the second is SIRSA, and the third and newest package is the American Rescue Plan. When we think about um, beginning in March of 2020, the Arizona Department of Education asked us to consider thinking about funding in three different ways. The first was our relief packages, the second was planning and preparation, and the third was the recovery part of that. Initially, the relief package ran from March through June, then the planning and preparation was June through September, and the re rest of the packages were considered the recovery packages. I want to share with you a little different view of that today. Planning and preparation, we lived in that phase much longer, and we were not alone. Other districts are in the same position as we are, but it's notable that the last act really is considering itself a recovery act instead of, instead of relief or planning and preparation. So just to highlight, and I like how they detailed this um, visually, when we think about ESSER monies, there's been three different rounds of monies that have been or will be made available to us to use within our district. The Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund, ESSER, um, round one came to us in March 27th through the Corona, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Uh -huh. That money has already been planned and we will need to do a revision of those monies and I will detail that more later. The second act that came about SIRSA, the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act was made available to us December 27th of 2020. Uh -huh. We have not planned for that money as of yet, but we are in the process of doing that right now. 
And the third act, the American Rescue Plan, as those monies have not yet been shared with us. But again, I will detail more um, in upcoming slides what that money is to look like. Here's a more detailed timeline for the recovery funds, including ESSER 1, 2, and 3, and the amounts per our state of Arizona for the funding. ESSER 1 at the state level was $277 million. The next ESSER 2 was in the amount of just over $1 billion, so four times the amount. And ESSER 3 monies are two times the amount of ESSER 2 monies within there. Overall, Arizona is project, projected to receive about $4 billion of recovery monies. This is what it looks like specifically for Page Unified School District in the amounts. Our ESSER allocation was just under one half million dollars. Our ESG allocation and Viri Vindi spoke to that in her presentation, um, just over $1 million. That money has already been fully expended as of December, 2020. ESSER2 monies came to us in the amount of just over $2 million. And ESSER3 monies, we are estimated to receive $5.8 million for total relief funding of $9.4 million. Um, in the board presentation itself is a hyperlink for you to see not only the PUSD estimated amount of this funding, but you can look and see the estimates of other districts as well. At this point in time, we understand that we are waiting for that. We had originally thought that we might receive that allocation amount by the first part of April. Um, so we are not holding our breath of when we will receive um, that funding, but I will make you aware as soon as we receive indeed the allocation allotted to us. I had spoken in the last two presentations about the sequencing of the order of our work right now. We are currently right now, as of today, living in three fiscal years and a graphic and upcoming slides will show that a little better. But this is a breakdown of our day to day work and what that looks like right now and where we're concentrating our efforts. We are currently in fiscal year 21 right now and that ends for us on June 30th of this year. Recently, within the last month or so, we received an allocation increase of $2,000 within our consolidated grant. Therefore, we are in the process of revising that money right now and shifting that. ESSER 1, although we have been planned for that money and some of that has already been spent out, we know that that plan needs to be revised. And the main reason within our district that the plan needs to be revised for our ESSER 1 monies is because we had planned for on-site support services to run through the remainder of the year. And we know that we went out for a waiver in January of this year for the entire month and did not offer on-site support services for our students. Um, and in February, with us starting back to virtual learning, we did not have them um, because students had the option to come in. Therefore, some of the staffing monies that we had set aside will need to be revised and used in a different way. The middle graphic fiscal year 22 grants, that's the process that our site teams are actively engaged in right now. They have conducted their comprehensive needs assessment. They have unpacked and done their root cause analysis, and they are writing their integrated action plans to support their programming for next school year. The deadline for that application and all grant applications in terms of entitlement is May 1. So that's the work that we are focused on right now. The plan given through the Department of Education to help districts manage this work and to make the load seem less um, cumbersome right now is to really focus on those first three arrows for now and then consider um, completing, planning, and applying for ESSER 2 monies completing planning and applying for ESSER 3 monies. And this shows the date of obligation for the grants as well. This is a graphic that I have shared multiple times in my presentations to you. This was part of a webinar series last summer, and it helped to provide guidance to school districts of where to prioritize. 
and how right now we are thinking about not only how to support our students, teachers, and families in their needs that are immediate, but in looking at long range planning as well. And they narrowed that long list of things down to the three most impactful investments that districts should consider moving forward. Number one, improve the district's capability to proactively identify individual student needs. Number two, improve the accessibility of differentiated instruction and support services, including mental health support services during both in-person and virtual situations. And the third, to simplify the complex array of new processes, procedures, and platforms necessary to operate a flexible school district. And these most impactful investments will also be at the forefront as we move forward and consider how we best plan for the COVID monies or the bubble monies as we're referring to them. During the ADE strategic planning town hall, they gave the Department of Education's why statement, their vision statement, and it simply reads, equity for all students to achieve their full potential. When we consider what this looks like at PUSD, this is our current vision statement. Page Unified School District is a community of learners who direct our collective actions and resources towards the unique learning needs of every child in order for all students to become college and career ready and successful in a global society. We also talk about our day-to-day -day efforts in the form of our mission statement, which reads, our schools are passionate about the learning for all mission and understand that every student matters. We are responsible and accountable for the education of every student that walks through our doors every day. And for this year, we added the words in parentheses, whether that be virtual or in person, because all students needed to be considered when thinking about this. I recently shared part of this presentation during an instructional leadership team meeting where department heads were part of the conversation. And the next question that we challenged them to think about is, we understand our state's why statement. We also understand our PUSD vision and mission statement. Our next step is to really consider our departmental why. Why are we functioning the way that we need to moving forward so that we can best build programs that support our students? The CDC in um, March during um, the National ESSA conference spoke a little differently when they were highlighting what relief efforts looked like. And they said in order for districts to move forward, they themselves as practitioners recognized that there was five, five main challenges or priorities that were facing every district across our nation. The first, providing students access to technology. The second, addressing food insecurity. The third, developing opportunities for online learning. The fourth, fostering social and emotional well being, and finally, maintaining student equity. During part one of this presentation, you had the opportunity to hear from two of our district directors who spoke to addressing food insecurity and fostering social and emotional well being. During the part four or the next installment of this presentation, when we get down to a more granular level of speaking about this, we also need to bring in the other uh, directors associated with the technology, developing opportunities for online learning, and most certainly maintaining student equity as part of our planning process moving forward. Also from the ADE strategic uh, planning meeting, they talked about the idea of missed opportunities. Right now, the term in education learning loss is really not viewed very kindly. And um, districts are doing everything they can to say, we, we don't like the, the usage of the word learning loss. However, whenever you read articles about COVID monies, that's always how they're going to attach um, themselves to that, the learning loss that we had. And we recognize that that's not a positive outlook, but this is the way that the Department of Ed has asked us to kind of reframe that a little bit and think about it a little differently. The term learning loss refers to any specific or general loss of knowledge and skills or the reversals in academic progress most commonly due to extended gaps or discontinuities into a student's education. Then they mentioned the word opportunity and they spoke to some of the opportunities that students might have missed during this past year. 
opportunities for optimal teaching and learning, opportunities to build strong relationship with peers, teachers, and other important adults on campus. And finally, they might have been missing some of the opportunities to develop strong social and emotional skills. But then they took the word opportunity and they reimagined it a little differently. And they said, yes, there perhaps was missed opportunities, but there's also a new opportunity for us to look at this a little differently. And they talked about it under the lens of shared responsibility. Shared responsibility is promoting all learners and expecting that we will receive movement in all of our systems towards equity. It's going back to knowing our why before moving to the what and how um, to also foster the idea of shared responsibility. And then they gave um, the next statement, which is really the most powerful one for us to reflect upon. Fostering and enacting shared responsibility will require significant structural changes, shifts in beliefs and behaviors, time, resources, and intentional strategies. We need to create opportunities that provide time for all teachers to come together for professional learning focused on an asset-based approach. We need to create staffing models that foster shared responsibility. We need to leverage guidance and related departments to build capacity and support teachers in meeting the needs of all students. And we need to expand our services in the areas of language, literacy, and wraparound support for our families. They continued, we need to consider how we're re-engaging students. Um, I will not read this slide to you, but in short, they talked about the idea of we must have parents as critical partners in this conversation. We must leverage how we communicate and connect with our families. We also need to consider bringing cross departmental teams to develop, review, refine our policies and practices to support attendance. For some of our students who have remained virtual for the duration of this year, when they return to us in August, that will be 18 months removed from exposure from our classrooms. And we need to consider what that looks like for those students, teachers, and our families. And finally, we need to establish attendance monitoring systems and notice the word disaggregate in bold writing. We need to disaggregate our data so that we can better identify who we're serving and who needs help and reaching out to them in a different way. They also spoke to our most vulnerable populations of students and said, whenever we have that inequities um, have become greater this year. And they gave some statistics associated with that. I want to jump down to bullet point number three. And from their research, they are saying the biggest drop in enrollment is among our youngest learners. Our kindergarten enrollment has declined across the state uh, by 10.59%. And then they used the term, remember that equal is not equitable. This is a graphic that I've shared with you before. The children are the students on the left um, is what it feels like. And you notice that the boxes are all, every, every student is given the same size box regardless of their needs. In the middle box, uh, this was the original um, definition of equity to give each student or child the box they need to be able to see over the fence. The most newest, the newest graphic associated with equity is the students on the right. And they truly are saying, yes, we need to, when needed, fill the gap and give them what they need to meet their needs. But more effectively, if we can remove the barriers that obstruct all students, that's going to lead to better sustainability and planning moving forward. They also talked through the idea of acceleration versus intervention. Acceleration refers to a wide variety of educational instructional strategies that ed educators use to advance the learning progress of students that help students catch up to their peers, perform at grade level on the academic state standards. And it gives very specific examples of how we might consider and should consider leveraging our best resources, which are our teachers moving forward. We need to prepare and support teachers to prioritize high quality, effective tier one instruction focused on grade level standards. 
We need to provide appropriate and needed tier two and tier three instruction for our students. We need to increase the amount of instructional instruction provided to students by providing supplemental and or extended learning opportunities with a teacher or other specialist. We need to maintain the same high expectation for learning rather than lowering, lowering the expectation. And finally, we need to deploy a high yield instructional and support strategies. They further broke it down to explain acceleration this year, this way, asking everyone involved to know their why. That goes back to departments and their vision statements and an understanding of how we all support, um, we better can support one another. Connect with and consider all student families and educators. Ensure expectations are high, not hurried. Listen to all stakeholders to determine and drive decision-making. They need to be partners in these decisions moving forward. Empower all educators and students to develop a sense of agency. Reflect collaboratively and consistently what's working, what's not working, and how do we change that. Assess and be accountable for all students. Take all necessary action to move forward effectively. And finally, embrace and embody equity for all learners. How do we do that? <laughs> this is the timeline. And then the last graphic that I will share with you has some next steps of what that looks like. I had shared with you several months back now that um, at the end of this, if there is an end, we will be thinking about six fiscal years of programming in total. Um, this graphic is the best one that I've seen that shows what that looks like. As a reminder, we are living this year, this school year in fiscal year 21. We are planning right now for fiscal year 22 and the COVID relief monies are dated back to March of fiscal year 20. Therefore, right now we are currently living within three budget years to consider dealing with. With the onset of ESSER II monies and ESSER III monies, the landscape also changes a little bit. So yes, these monies are to be planned for by fiscal year 24 for the ESSER III part of this. However, with carry forward allowability, we actually have until fiscal year 25 to consider using those monies if needed. Um, and so, we will continue to go back, look at this graphic and think about how this impacts how we're planning moving forward. And then finally, again, high level, this is high level thinking right now, um, but just a recap of what we've talked about. When we consider what a grant is, a grant lives smack dab in between programming and fiscal. And it's our responsibility to develop quality programming that supports the needs of our students and that we are, we're, we're required to be fiscal stewards and to show fiscal responsibility of how we're planning to spend these monies. Our sites right now are in that process of doing that work. They're completing their needs assessment, their root cause, and they're writing their integrated action plans. Our entitlement fund timeline um, opened with our preliminary allocation in March 1, and that closes on May 1. Our preliminary allocations have been released across all funding sources. Our poverty counts information. We were given an interesting choice this year of looking back over fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 19. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20, because you look at prior year counts, we were given the option of looking back two fiscal years ago um, to select that. Our poverty count information had not changed substantially. We chose the year back from that uh, through a conversation with Millie and Art and what that looks like to support those numbers and to develop programming for fiscal year 22 in terms of Title I funding. We have had ongoing consultations with tribal and private schools and what this work looks like. Just so you're aware, right now our tribal consultation consists of consulting with the Navajo Nation and we have one annual tribal obligation according to Title I that we meet twice um, 
for tribal consultation. We received an email recently saying that at the Department of Education, they have changed their monitoring process for how this will look. And there are two other, the Hopi tribe and um, one other that even though the Hopi tribe has six students for us, um, Paiute had one student, but they're changing their process of how they're identifying the 50 mile radius. And so we do need to be prepared that next year we will hold three tribal consultations um, during this time frame. And that is just one example of some changes that will continue um, as we move forward. Our linked competitive grants have a timeline of May 30th, most notably our CSI comprehensive support and improvement and our targeted support and improvement schools. So a little bit longer, but we do want that to go back and to align to the work done um, with their Title I planning and what that looks like. We are still awaiting year two funding updates um, from the governor's office, the Governor Emergency Education Relief Fund, and those have not been made available yet. And we are still anticipating the ESSER three allocation. We will continue planning and I am not going to open the hyperlink for you, but within there is one of the latest planning documents that was presented through the Department of Education that just shows allowable expenditures and what that might look like for districts to consider that. That will be part of the conversation as we move forward with different planning teams is really looking at our local needs and looking at the allowability of that and how we can truly reimagine what we're doing moving forward. Um, and finally, ADE had used the words, um, um, re-engaging students, but really it is thinking about how we reimagine all of that and the opportunity that we have moving forward because when we think about our sustainability planning and our long, long range strategic planning, um, we need to start considering how we're spending this money a little differently moving forward. And the other part of that is we know that it's ever changing and that there's updates that we are receiving almost on a daily basis sometimes is what that feels like. Um, we also can be reminded that we plan for what happens, but we also need to be flexible in how we consider that we can revise some of these things moving forward as well. Okay. What questions do you have for me? <laughs> I just need clarification, if you would. Over on page 18, where it talks about the biggest drop in enrollment is among our youngest learner, the kindergartners, by 10, almost 11%. What's the situation with our district? Um, D, I would have to get that information from the building principal to report if our trends match that as well. This was um, presented through the department yeah. and sharing the state statistics for that, but I will most certainly write that down and do the comparison from last year so that I can better speak to that. Another one, uh, two pages down on the Accelerate, where it talks about ensure the expectations are high, not hurried. What do they mean by hurried? Um, that refers to the idea, and I'm sorry, I'm not able to find the slide. Um, there we go. Uh, found it. Okay. Um, it's the idea that in education, sometimes we like to think that there's a magic bullet that's going to come in and it's going to fix something. And when we think about spending for the sake of spending or purchasing something that we don't draw a sustainability plan around or that we implement something and think, well, we will purchase this and this is going to fix that. That is not necessarily true. Um, we need to think about how we're spending those resources. We still need to ensure that we're setting high expectations of learning for all students. We know that um, it will take some time to do some of this, 
that we can't say, well, we're going to lower the expectation of students <laughs> to make it look like we're making gains. No, we're still going to hold on to those grade level expectations of learning for our students. We're going to ensure that we have the appropriate resources when we're planning for that. Um, but yeah, we can't expect to come in and be like, okay, we're, we're fixed next year, or we're going to buy this and this is going to help us get here. We need to think about setting those achievable goals along the way. Okay, I, thank you. Can I say something, Bob? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay I was just going to say that on every regular school board um, agenda on the reports, we have our data dashboards. They should be there for every... Um, meeting and it would be super easy to compare what our enrollment is for the last five years and what the trends are because we have a page that tracks all of that so before you go and try to find all that somewhere else it should all be there it's just probably um, take a little bit of comparing and we should be able to figure that out pretty quickly okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you Sandra anybody else Thank you, Dee, for those observations and uh, comments. And uh, the one uh, that I, that grabbed me right off the bat because of the just the environment we've been in and uh, trying to, we always talk about one thing as a board, uh, how do we engage our stakeholders? How can we better engage our stakeholders? How can we get, you know, that, that and, and it goes to the point that, that's, that says, listen to all stakeholders to determine and drive it decision making. And perhaps there's some, opportunity in there for us to create because of the new tools and resources that are being developed a better mechanism if you will to uh, help get input for us on various issues and those kind of things and uh, so anyway I'd just like to throw that out there and and just to, to say hey this one this one would be good for our, for our school board Anybody else? I might have just one question maybe or a concern regarding um, the presentation as far as, you know, the students that are affected um, with the COVID situation. Is there any consideration as far as, um, uh, let's see, assisted, assisting students and parents together or parents that are probably, you know, affected by the COVID situation and their students coming to school or doing online? So I guess I just want to make sure that I understand your question so that I, I can answer it correctly. Um, the landscape for all students and families we recognize has changed substantially this year. Um, we cannot think about addressing one without addressing the other <laughs> because our parents should be, our parents and our families, um, it should be a partnership of what that looks like. And so that will be reimagining not only the same way that they had a crash course and what that looks like to assist students as they're working from home with their learning. We also need to, um, think about how we provide that support at new levels to them as we move into this next phase, no matter what that I, looks like. I, yeah, I guess so what I'm saying is that exactly, um, you know, you have a lot of parents in the community um, affected that were struggling probably because they were not working or one or the, one parent working or both parents not working, whatever the case may be, or grandparents taking care of their kids. Um, and, you know, what the issues regarding internet connectivity. So I know moving forward next year, I don't know if we're gonna still have these similar issues, but you know, you talk about equity and ensuring that's across the board, you know. So just something to think about in mind. Right, and, and that has become not only at the state level, but really something that they've said, be mindful and pay attention to that and really dive in and look at what that looks like for your local community <laughs> and be prepared to support based on your need for that. And there will need to be critical conversations. There will need to be uncomfortable conversations sometimes 
around that, um, that that dialogue does need to be opened up in a different way than we've seen ever before. And that could be why, because, you know, you have a lot of kindergarten kids that, you know, for whatever the case may be, they're, they're challenged, you know, with the situation, uh, either with internet connection or internet just not able to have it, or, you know, the parents, um, financial situation, whatever the case may be, you know, there's a challenge there, obviously, and we need to identify those challenges. Correct. You can't fix something that we can't do something about things that we're not aware <laughs> about. And so we need to definitely draw upon our awareness of that. And one of the preliminary conversations, or a, I guess a realization that has happened already is the idea of when they talk about kindergarten, for example, well, there may be students who come to us next year as first grade students, but that didn't enter our doors last year. So thinking about not only we're conscientious about that right now in terms of our transition year, students moving from second to third and changing schools, students moving from preschool to kindergarten, but also mm -hmm. kind of expanding that window of opportunity too to think about those students specifically. And I think they worded it really nicely here when they said really paying attention to the individual needs of our students because we yeah. are gonna have to be mindful of that because there were different, different situations for all of our students and we have to provide that differentiated support for all of them. And it's not going to be a one size fits all model. Well, it can't. Absolutely. Because, you know, as a parent myself and, you know, my child attending school, you know, uh, feedback is very important, important, uh, you know, with communication, are you getting the feedback from parents on, on any of these issues, you know, and is there enough feedback to support the facts, you know, moving forward. So that's what we need is really good communication with the school and parents as far as what needs, if they're being met or not. And I don't know if that's happening right now. Um, correct. I know right now during the planning processes of schools going through that, um, there is um, conversations about what that looks like but even mm -hmm. a more increased effort, especially when it comes to the sustainability planning of these funds will be imperative for that to happen. Um, within Title VI programming, I know there was a survey sent out recently to families um, as part of their needs assessment and the garnering of information. So a lot of that work is in place. Um, mm -hmm. The same uh, way, it just needs uh, to be a magnified effort. <clears throat> How is this communication being sent out is it email only mail you know these are just a ways of communicating out and, and getting this feedback back you know we just have to think of all lines of communication as far as making sure we get enough feedback from the community correct and that was even part of the discussion last year um on the onset set of this in june when a team came together for the what we called at the time the continuous learning plan and the idea of the more ways that we can send out information, the better. Um, we found that there's a greater social media presence right now, and that's proven to be effective. Mm -hmm. We're still getting out information um, to chapter houses. Um, we are open to any form of better communicating out and in doing that in multiple ways um, to ensure that voices are heard. Okay. Okay. That was all the questions I had. Question yeah, I, for you, Jeannie. I'm sorry, Sandra. I was just going to make one comment before the Go conversation ahead. goes away. Um, so I was just going to say, D, we currently have 140 kindergartners, and our typical class sizes right now are anywhere from a 156 to 205. So it looks like our kindergarten enrollment is down, but we would have to look at that compared to last year. And then the other thing to remember is, that kindergarten by law is not required by the state of Arizona. Basically, you know, compulsory school attendance doesn't happen until first grade. So parents really don't have to send their kids by law. So I'm just saying that might be part of the problem. Okay. And sometimes the change may be a cohort size mm -hmm. change that we would have had regardless. Right. That's um, true, too. That's true, too. But I think we could easily compare that to last year's dashboards and see if that's, you know, 
And we do have different cohorts. I mean, when you look at the enrollment right now, we have some like fourth grade, no, fifth grade has 156 right now versus ninth grade, which I think is our highest right now is 205. So that's a significant difference. That's a 25% difference in cohort. Correct. And we recognized that this year in particular, we were expecting decreased student enrollment um, even prior to COVID because of other um, things within our the closure of the power plant, for example. We were thinking that we, we had anticipated loss of enrollment. So really the message is, is clear um, that ADE is just saying to segregate your data in multiple formats to arrive at the best response you can of what the data is telling us. And so to unpack it in multiple ways and ask different questions about that data to arrive um, at the best informed decision that you can. Oh, my question, Jeannie, was about Title VI program. Is that current that um, survey currently out? Um, it was sent out last week, and it was for JOM and Title VI programming. Okay, I think the only place that I've seen it is on social media, but it would be good to have it go out to email addresses as well, too. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bob. Sorry about that. Uh, you can hear me now. Okay, I think we're done with our comments. Again, thank you, Ms. Wood, for the presentation. Appreciate that and all you do. My goodness. Uh, it, everything's changing the way we do business and uh, you're, you're trying to run in a fast lane. Try to keep, we'll try to keep up. Thank you so much. Let's move on to item number D. Um, and I was excited to hear about this one, and uh, I'm really thrilled to welcome Encompass uh, for recognition of our Page Unified School District students. And so, Nikki Thomas, I see you're online, and uh, you have some guests with you that we're excited about. We do. Uh, President Candelier, um, Superintendent Wall, and the board members, thank you so much for allowing us this opportunity to. Um, recognize these students for the hard work that they did with us during our COVID vaccine event that we did over in Fredonia. Um, I'm actually going to pass it on to Ashley Hobson, our nurse practitioner, and she's going to continue. Good evening. Good evening. I want to start off by saying that Encompass was asked by the Coconina County Health and Health Services to administer vaccines in Fredonia, one of our underserved communities. I'm newer to the area, newer to Arizona. So when the CEO of Encompass said we were going to a small community, I said, smaller than Paige? Is that possible? <laughs> uh, Fredonia Island. <laughs> <It's> possible. <laughs> Island is about 1,500 individuals, and they had been contacting the county to get vaccines, anything they had available to have an event, because there's no hospital, there were no clinics, nothing nearby. I believe Colorado City was the closest place they could travel. At that time, the, um, the phase we were in was 65 and up with comorbidities. So we were able to organize everything with the medical staff over here at Encompass as well as administration, getting over to Fredonia and administering 60, 69. 69 vaccines in about a four to five hour period. And that's one thing I can say about Encompass and its CEO is when Joe Wright notices a need, he works diligently to fill it. And it was exciting to be part of that, to be able to go fill that need. After that event, he noticed a need too, and it might've been me limping around and pure exhaustion. So he actually worked and contacted Page Unified School District and got a wonderful group of volunteers, these kids you see before me, to come and help out with our second vaccine event. And I can personally say I'm so glad he did because we administered 101 on, what day was that? March 29th, 101 vaccines. And these kids were absolutely amazing. To have the enthusiasm that they brought 
to have the customer service, to have that youth was beyond words, honestly. And their excitement fueled our excitement. Our excitement fueled their gratitude of Fredonia residents. And it really, really was nice having them with us. I was able to sit down at lunch and kind of talk and get to know them as much as we were able to in a short period of time. And my goodness, a wonderful group of students with dreams, plans, and aspirations that are pretty, pretty awesome. And I can say as a new resident of Page, with the kindergartner enrolled in Page Unified School District, <laughs> that it's very encouraging to see what this district produces in these students. So I'm gonna go ahead and present some certificates of recognition to the five individuals we have. We have Mr. Jonah Holliday. I'm gonna get up, look at me. We have Ms. Kira Jenkins. Ms. Ariana Jenkins. Ms. Mira Little. And Ms. Ryan Thomas. We actually have two more not in attendance today. They are Ms. Nadia Begay and Ms. Need Redhair. Yeah. Ms. Nev right here. They couldn't attend today, but they will definitely get their certificates. Thank you all for being a part of it. Thank you all for enjoying it. And I hope that you guys realize you are part of history. You really are. The medical frontier, what is going on with COVID, it is devastating on the fact that the mortality with it, but it's also very exciting with the science and with the medical advancements that are happening. And I know a lot of you guys want to get into the medical career. So you guys got to be a part of history and Encompass thanks you and I thank you. Hey, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Way to go guys. We're just excited about that. And do you, you have something to say? Any board members? <laughs> Okay, I, I'm sorry. On my screen, it was just you that I was seeing. So I think, man, she's taking the floor. But hey, I just, <laughs> want, I just wanted to give my shout out to all the all the students and uh, Encompass for the partnership we have with you. Uh, and uh, we're just so excited that uh, you thought of us and you took some of our finest with you. And some of them, I'll, I'm looking now, I'd recognize those tennis shoes anywhere. So uh, just, it's great to see you guys. But again, uh, <laughs> Students of Page Unified School District, you represent you, yourself, your family, and your community, and your school well. Thank you so much. And we look forward to more of this kind of participation. And again, thank you for being part, part and parcel of the presentation. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Hey, we're going to move on in our agenda. Uh, and next is the um, presentation of the Page Unified School District Medical, Medical Benefits Package for 2021-2022. Uh, Terry Maurer, and I believe this is an action item. It just says information, but is this an action item, I believe? Yes. Yes, okay, so I'll need a motion in a second. I make a motion to approve the agenda item, Page Unified School District Medical Benefit Package for the 2021 through 2022 school year. Uh, Sandra? Actually, hold on. I thought we were approving it later. I thought we were approving it later. Is on this the just information? A, B. This is just a presentation. Oh, okay, well, I'm the sorry. Approval, okay. The That's later on in the agenda. To 8B. Yeah, got gotcha. you. Okay, thank you so I much. Appreciate that. So this is information my... only. <laughs> we never ignore you, but thank you very much. Yeah, ignore <laughs> my, my motion. <laughs> my, my error, my error. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Maurer. So, good evening, uh, Governing Board President, Governing Board members, Superintendent Wallen, uh, guests, and colleagues. Uh, let me share my screen here as we get started. Um, and if everyone, if I get a thumbs up that we can see that, perfect. So every year uh, we go through the reauthorization of our benefits package. Uh, and, and in particular, in this case, we're speaking about the medical benefits that the Page Unified School District offers its employees. 
so when we look at a couple of the guiding principles, uh, the first part is looking around long range planning and then staying within budget limits. Uh, those are the two pieces that this presentation is going to really work around. Uh, and then the second part to this is maintaining equity in all employee benefits. Uh, now, I, I do want to say, uh, because uh, recruitment and retention is a big part of the PUSD benefits package, uh, specifically recruitment, having been out on hundreds of recruiting trips, talking to hundreds and thousands of potential employees, uh, PUSD's benefits package is extremely rich and robust and very, very stable over the years. In this instance, we've seen though, over the past couple of years, the medical portion of our benefits, the, the, the medical piece continually is creeping up. Um, over the past couple of years, we've been able to mitigate that down uh, somewhere between two and 3% of an increase. Uh, and, and in the original years, it was somewhere in the 10 to 15% increases. Uh, this year, and this is not COVID related, so I want to just take that off to the side. Uh, COVID has its own parts to it. This is pure just medical as if it was every other year. So in this case, uh, the current medical insurance premium for PUSD for about 301 employees, which is what the estimate is based off of, uh, this year was $1.78 million. Um, that's the medical benefit. Uh, the, the renewal of that package that we would offer our employees would cost the district approximately $1.91 million, uh, which is an increase from about $494 per month per employee to $531 per month per employee, or a district increase of $133,000 or 7.5%. That's the foundation for this conversation. Now, the dental is running, our dental package is running very well that we run that internally. It's self-funded. Uh, and if you remember a couple of years ago, we were actually able to lower the premium costs to our dental. Our vision, which is VSP, uh, we have a, 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 tier, a two tiered program, the initial uh, piece, and then the buy up option, which is running also very, very well. Uh, many of our employees take advantage of that. And then our life insurance is, is also very, very stable. Uh, and is all of these are, have no proposed changes for the 21-22 school year. So really this is just around the medical benefits that we're talking about, okay? Uh, so a couple of different options I wanted to present uh, because in the context of this conversation, I want us to remember that we're, we're building a, a, a package benefits package that can transition this year, next year, the following years without these substantial increases. And I'm going to show you where that, that increase is coming right now. So when we look at option one, option one would be business as normal. We keep everything the same. The district incurs the expense. And so I can, can Mr. Canary, can you see my cursor right here moving? Yes, sir. Perfect. So the district would incur the expense of approximately $133,000. Uh, our silver package uh, would stay the same. That is the, the package that we offer all full-time employees in PUSD, no matter of the job, everyone is treated equitably. Uh, it would remain uh, zero, which is this year. Next year would remain zero as well. Everybody would have that option. However, the increase to the employee on the gold package would go from what they're currently paying now per month, which is $74. And this is just for the employee. This is not for the employee and family, the employee and um, spouse. This is pure employee would go from $74 to approximately $130 per month. And I, I want us to think about that a little differently in that the majority of our employees are not 12 month employees. They're nine month employees. So this increase is going to not be over 12 months for them, but for nine months and then divide it out against the salary. So almost double the cost 
if the employee elected to go up to the gold package. Now that gold is a very rich, um, a very rich uh, package, but it, it, it is also, it's an option. So that's one option for us to is just keep everything the same. If we look at option two, we don't change anything in the plan design, right? The plan design stays exactly the same, but instead of the Page Unified School District incurring the cost, which is about $133, or sorry, $133,000, we pass that through. We pass that cost through to the employee. And so you would see in the silver package this year, zero dollars costs all our, all our employees, nothing to be insured by PUSD to next year, $40 per month. So it's a, it's a, it's a pass through to the employee that would take care of this here. The gold package would also incur that $40 plus the additional. So it would be $170 per month for the employee in option two. All right, let me, let me stop right there before we get to option three and see if there's any questions around these two points because the next option is the option where we start looking at the plan design and changes that will help mitigate this cost for our employees. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, option three. So option three, if we can see here, currently our premium per employee per month is $494. With plan design changes, we would be able to move that cost from $494 to $507 per employee per month, which means the increased district, the increased distance, the increased difference for the district is about $46,000 we would see a move from the silver package to value gold. We would still be able to maintain the benefit level at the introductory employee at zero. And then here's where the, 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 the real crux of the plan design comes into play. So when we think about our, our gold package at $74 per month per employee, with the plan design change, we would be able to see a slight increase for those employees from $74 to $79, instead of that $74 to 130 for the employee. Now remember, that's just the employee. The, the, it goes up for spouse or, or a significant other, or not spouse, sorry, spouse or family, um, that, that would tear up as well. So let's, let's look at the design changes uh, and then we can see if we have any questions from there. Now I'm, I'm going to, am I still sharing the screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I wanna orient you with the screen. You guys have this uh, in your packet and I really wanna start right here with the base plan right in the middle. It says current classic silver. So that is the current plan that PUSD offers all employees when they become employed with us. This is what the benefits build out looks like. And this is where we looked at plan design in order to mitigate that cost for the employees and for the district and build something that is sustainable. So in this case, we would see the classic silver move to the value gold. Now remember, the increased cost for the employee would still be zero on this move. The difference in the plan design is where you can see in the red. So instead of the deductible being $500, it would move to $750 for the employee. The max out of pocket would go from $4,500 to $5,000. And then you can see an incremental increase down this row from 30 to 35, 40 to 45, the deductible, and it goes from 80% plan coverage to 75%. So subtle differences, which will, they will add up over time. We, we, we do recognize that, but maintains a very rich plan that we offer employees in PUSD. The buy-up option. So the buy-up option, our current copay gold, we would look to move it to the classic gold. And you can see in this case, originally there's no deductible with the copay gold. 
Now the deductible would move to 300 for individual, 900 for the employee. And then as we look down the plan design, we can see the greens are enhancements to the plan and the red is the changes where we're going to save some of the money at. Uh, so in this case, the max out of pocket goes down, the chiropractic and x-ray goes down, uh, we get the, 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 the actual uh, durable medical equipment, hearing aids, things of that nature, uh, the deductible, and then 85% of the plan. Uh, one of the things that we worked very diligently to keep was the idea that the prescription benefits, as you can see, are unchanged. So currently right now, no matter what your prescription plan is, it would remain unchanged on this move. Uh, and then also the plan, which we call the HDHP, which is the, the high deductible plan that comes with a health savings account would remain unchanged as well. Uh, so then we can look at now, in this case, the, the, the change, let me blow this up a little bit for you. When we look at the cost, currently it's $74 and in this case, we would move to 79. For the family, we can see, uh, uh, for, sorry, the employee and the spouse, we can see a, a slight change. We can see the uh, employee and child move up. And then also in the same idea, the employee and family moves up. This also helps here in the classic silver to value gold, because when we go to, um, to insure our spouse and children, this would also go up. Uh, you have that as a documentation uh, that was attached to the packet as well. All right, so let's go back uh, to the presentation. Uh, and then see if there's questions and thoughts. Board members, any uh, comments, questions? <laughs> Well, Dr. Merrill, I'll just say I know that you guys have worked extremely hard and I appreciate all the work you put into it and providing those options in a, in a time when everything is going up for sure. And uh, I'll be looking forward to your recommendations as we as we move forward. But uh, yeah, it looks like uh, you guys have mitigated some things really, really uh, pretty well. Yes, sir. There, there, there really is two, I mean, two huge parts to this. The, the, yep. recru the recruitment piece, when we talk about uh, recruiting new employees, um, you know, having, having stood around so many other districts and just listening to uh, what their medical benefits packages look like, uh, we, we are leaps and bounds above. This still keeps us there. Uh, and then really the, the, the cost to the employee, um, we, we already know that um, it's, it's, it's expensive to live in PAGE and to yes. provide such a rich benefits package at, at, a, at a very reasonable cost and then to keep that cost down year over year. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do is build out not only for next year, but the following years, because with these plan designs, we would see uh, in essence, very little increase on our, on our benefits, knowing that uh, the, the, this is a sustainable plan. It's going to get us a couple of years. Yeah. I have a question, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Um, Terry, on the when you were showing the the medical changes, the plan design, there is a, a note at the bottom in red that says PSD will put in seventy two dollars and fifty cents into a health savings account for each month for those who elect the HDHPA medical plan, which is about eight hundred seventy dollars a year in a health savings plan, which is quite quite done well. Can you kind of explain that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so when we look at the HD, let me minus this down a little bit for us. When we look at the high deductible uh, plan, you can see right away uh, in this plan, the deductible itself is $1,500. Uh, and then from that, the plan will pay 80% and once the deductible is met. So by putting the, um, the, the, the difference, it's the difference between what the, the plan, the base plan costs, which is our silver, by taking that difference and providing it to this employee here, uh, that will take care of almost 
the first half of the deductible provide, as they get into the utilization of the plan. Um, so a health savings account uh, can travel with the employee, but let's say they go in uh, for some chiropractic care. Uh, if they were on our silver plan, it would cost $30. In this case, it, it, the, the, H, the HSA card will actually be able to charge against that and it comes off the card. So really this plan, the high deductible uh, plan is for that employee who uh, is uh, very cognizant of their, their day in and day out life. Uh, and, and in the context of uh, a, a catastrophic injury, which we hope no one ever has, the plan still protects at the top end. So the max out of pocket in this plan is $5,500. Uh, in the new plan, it's $5,000. And then on the classic gold, it would be $4,000. So our employees still have a very low ceiling out of pocket, no matter which plan they pick. And since it's a HSA plan, I can contribute more if I want to, to that plan. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And, that, and we do encourage that. So uh, when we do talk to individuals who go on the HSA plan uh, or the HDHT plan, we talk to them about if you match and let me roll this down a little bit. If you match this contribution, and if there is something unfortunate that happens, uh, your deductible in this instance would be met by that, by that card. Uh, and then from there, uh, you, you would incur the cost up to that first, that first ceiling. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, I know we've always talked about this uh, as, as uh, being a, not a destination district and some of the things that we can do. And we hope that this, this is palatable to staff uh, because like I said, I know you worked hard to get to this point. And uh, so again, uh, thank you so much for, for all your work. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number F, uh, if I'm in the right area. So that's recognition and approval of donations made to the district. I'm going to go ahead and read those uh, that were donated, and then we'll need a, uh, an action. It'll be an action item, and, um, and then we'll uh, approve or disprove those things. $1,000 individually wrapped fabric masks were donated by Inscription House Clinic. Thank you so much, Inscription House. Approximately 50 adults size sweat, sweatshirts were donated by Dixie Ellis with the Sand Devil logo on them. Thanks, Dixie Ellis. Uh, multiple staff and community members donated used clothing to the Clothing Exchange Program. Thanks so much for that. And the Coconino Coalition for Children and Youth are donating 50 child abuse prevention kits for families. Thank you so much for that. Those are the dona donations. I'll need an action. Uh, a motion for an action and a second. I make a motion to approve the donated items to the district. Second. Uh, I, think I second that seconded. motion. Okay. okay, we've got a second. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Any other comments uh, regarding these things? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, now the governing board reports. Uh, uh, go ahead, let's start it off. Anyone have anything they'd like to uh, note specifically? Go ahead, Sandra. Okay. I just wanted to say that I really appreciated um, the one write-up we had about Mrs. Wald, because um, especially because I had a similar conversation with my, several of my kids this week. And um, I just wanted to, I mean, it's been a rough year for everybody. We've said that yep. enough times. Yep. But um, the conversation I had with my students was that they really appreciate the teachers who teach, who treat them as students and human beings and not just as a product that needs to go through the system. Yeah. And the conversation was also that, um, you know, we can be fixing systems, but still treat each other with kindness. And that the motivating, that the important things that motivate my students, and I'm assuming many other students is, they can um, hate a subject matter. Right. But if the teacher is fabulous they will love it and do what they can to you know do a better yep. job at it 
And they can love a subject matter, but they will drop a class because the teacher is just, they just don't feel they can work with that teacher. Yeah. So I would just, just want to do a shout out to all the teachers who are so very aware of that and do such a good job in making our kids feel happy and valued because I know there's been a lot of that out there and I just wanted to um, just thank them all for, for trying so hard and feeling our student, making our students feel good. So thank you. Thank, thanks, Ms. Kidman. That's awesome. Uh, I'll echo all of those things. Next, anybody else have a comment you'd like to make a report of anything? Des, go ahead. So I want to start off. Um, I didn't attend the NAFIS conference, but I had a chance to try to sit in on one NAFIS um, board, I'm sorry, NAFIS Hill visit at 6.30 in the morning. But because of the time difference in Washington and here, there was just a huge mix up. So that didn't happen for their end. And then second, oh, and then I did catch, I think, two, one tail end of a hill visit and another one as well, too. But I just appreciate um, Superintendent Wallens and his support with um, the hill visits and also Dr. Deborah Dennison Jackson and I think San Carlos School District did an amazing job as well, too. But I appreciate um all of that that took place. Um, and then I also attended the 3A basketball championship game. Um, that was just kind of really nice to see a good insight from um, from a, an outside perspective because I called them, um, there was some concerns. So I was just calling around and double checking how, what the actual capacity limit was at East Mark High School. But I do want to make a shout out to the Gosh, Queen Creek Unified School District, which is also a part, you know, of um, Eastmark High School to, for hosting the championship basketball games. And of course, I got to catch up with um, the previous um, principal here from Page, who is currently the principal there at Eastmark High School, Mr. Paul Gagnon. So um, I just asked him, I said, hey, if you need a volunteer to help out, let me know. I'd be more than happy to help out whatever way. And so I did, so it was nice, but I didn't go in as a board member for Paige, but more so for um, Arizona School Board Association. And it was pretty unique and great job to both teams or all four teams, um, but more so our girls and boys basketball team, congratulations and amazing job to all of our fans, our parent-based fan supporters. Thank you for paying attention and being cognitive of wearing your face masks and following directions. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And then also recently, last week, I also attended the National School Board Association Conference, and that was all virtual. A lot of great speakers, presenters, and I just thought it was very unique to have my first insight with the National School Board Association. But um, I got to learn some things. I would like to share some, maybe possibly some good um, presentations that were presented um, at our next um, study session. So I think that is all I have. Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Fowler. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Ms. Des or Ms. D? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chuck. Okay, and, and I'll, ju I'll just say a couple things. I've been really excited talking to some of the teachers and some folks just talking about how one of the, one of the real nice things that we don't hear a whole lot about, uh, I'm hearing about some of our young kids, how agile and mobile they are on everything with Google, classrooms, Every, they're manipulating this thing. Just They're doing great and uh, show up to the testing and everything else. I think we had over 75%, if not more. But I mean, how adept they are at uh, this equipment that uh, is so strange to some of us older folks, maybe sometimes. And they just are able to manipulate their way all over the place on these things. I can't help but think that, you know, you talk about making lifetime learners. I think that's re a real 
maybe one of those hidden gems out of this whole thing, the kids that really, and the parents that really jump in and apply themselves to this technology. And so I'm really excited about that. The other thing I'll say real, real quickly is that um, I've been really excited to hear about the, the benchmark data that we've been seeing uh, from the classrooms. And it's actually surprised me to no end. And I don't know if I apologize if it surprises me, but it's a really pleasant thing to see where you see uh, significant percentages of improvements in math and English. And, and it's really, uh, really, really great uh, in some of these classrooms and, and uh, in some of our general testing. And we're hoping to maybe hopefully see something when it comes to the AZ Merit. Uh, but like I said, congratulations to the teachers. Keep it up. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I continue to see what I think to be are the threads that tie pre-K all the way to 12. I had a great conversation with Penny Case and appreciate that so much and her uh, literally in her interaction with Nancy and, and that group. And so I appreciate that a bunch. Uh, so that's what I've got. I'm not going to talk about basketball because we don't have time. <laughs> so that'll, that'll be the end of, end of my report. And uh, so Superintendent Wallen, you're, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. And that is awesome what you're talking about and goes back to what uh, we've been planning, which is our pathway to a B district. And um, those three pieces that go in that, and that's a guaranteed and viable curriculum so that we know everyone's learning that we have sound instructional practices and that we have assessments in place to align to the standards. And that's what happens when you test the standards is you start seeing a big change. Uh, and that is awesome. Just a quick shout out on the side to the Page High School winter guard team. They scored superior, which is first place in their winter competition. So very pleased you can go on the Page UD website and the girls are all right there. The participants are right there. Um, each week, I begin my, um, I end Friday morning with a, what we call a district status virtual meeting. And it's for 60 minutes. And we, we have the principals all reporting in, assistant principals and everyone. And I always prep that meeting with a strategic question for principals to consider uh, on our pathway to a B district. And so this last week, uh, I asked what changes or innovations from this year do you want to make sure you keep reflecting back on this year and all of the stuff that we are facing? So what changes from this year do you want to keep? And came up with a huge list and it just goes to show the energy that's out there circulating among our teachers and everyone. And it was about acceleration versus remediation. And you just saw in Jeannie's presentation, a piece of that. High impact learning strategies, strategies that are going to need us the biggest bang for our buck. Um, use of technology, blended, personalized, pre-testing, universal responses. In, enrichment is, is the big piece that I keep pushing because enrichment is going to get us where we are. Just like you said, um, President Candelaria, think about those kindergartners who are saying they lost learning. Look at the executive skills that they are mastering. They are able to log in. They're able to make decisions. They're able to troubleshoot. They're able to diagnose, they're able to analyze. So did we really lose as much as we're saying we did? And we need to redefine that conversation. And, and I understand for the grant purposes, we have to report it as a loss, but in the big picture, we had a lot of fine things happening. Achieve 3000, fine arts, BT tracking, use of technology, social emotional learning. We're getting our grant that we received for school safe schools online. We have. Uh, one of our staff members on board now, we're beginning to organize and put that in place. Increased parent contact with one of our programs called Class Dojo uh, and use of Seesaw for parent contact. Those are just great ideas and just talked about all the exciting things that are happening. Uh, a shout out to Page Middle School for their fourth, fourth quarter. I ask every uh, site to provide a curriculum map for the last quarter because BT is front loaded. The idea with our BT standards is that we have those all mastered by the time we go into our April testing. So what do we do from April and May? And so the middle school stepped up and did a, quote, finish strong curriculum map, quote, identifying the focus for their kids. And that focus is looking at standards that the kids have, have had uh, difficulties with throughout the year and getting that mastery back in place. Just tremendous. Then there was Desert View. Desert View is documenting learning that uh, becoming a B district. 
In a weekly progress meeting with the principal, and I do that every week, we examine star data. In fifth grade, and that's, these are fifth graders going to sixth grade, ELA scores dramatically increased from quarter one to 31.2% 31, 31 to quarter four to 56.58% in mastery. 56% of the kids are mastering. Math, unbelievable. Math increased from quarter one at 32.4% to quarter four at 82.5% of the students mastering their standards. One of the teachers posted star grade equivalent increases of from 3.9 in the fall to 4.6 in the spring. Star is the benchmark assessment that they use at Desert View and Lakeview to support learning. So in terms of academics, in terms of moving to that B district, we are on our way. And one of the things I wanna to say to parents, it's really important that you check your email and phone numbers at the school site to make sure we have those correct numbers. We're sending out weekly reports, weekly newsletters uh, to parents. And if you don't have the, we don't have the correct phone number or email address, it's not gonna get to you. So look at that. You think you have everything planned and ready to move forward. And then all of a sudden the Joint Legislative Budget Committee, which is a part of our state government, comes in and says, wait a minute, we're changing the classroom site fund. And that is, we have 6.1 increase in our taxes. So we have a surplus. So they are estimating, and this is what we put into our budget for next year, that the classroom site fund will be $733 per student. And then that goes to teachers performance compensation. That is a significant increase of $308 over last year's 425. So there's gonna be more funding there, but again, it's a one time, you know, if we can sustain, the economy can sustain that 6.1 increase, then that could be permanent. But in the meantime, we can begin to look at how we take that $211 and, and get that into teachers' pockets. So that's that's in the works. We're just waiting for guidance from the classroom site fund because the kind of the site fund changed. You remember there's three buckets, the legislature passed and the governor signed a bill. Now there's just one bucket. It's all going into one place. And then they've added some other allowable expenses in there that uh, were not in there before. So that is just tremendous. One of the things I think is really important, um, and, and, and I'll, one of the things as you're moving around, everyone, is what are strength spotters? Strength spotters. Think about that. But Mr. Jones, our COVID person, has gotten us approved, facilitated, and training for COVID-19 testing for employees on site. Uh, it results in 15 minutes. Um, he got 400 test kits. We went down and pulled those up. So we have those available in all the nurses stations. Uh, and those, all the nurses stations have been trained on how to administer those to adults. And we're working on permission forms to administer those to kids. So when uh, someone becomes asymptomatic, I think it's, it's, it's the right word. We can test them right there. They don't have to run home or go stand in line somewhere else. We can test them right there and get the results back in 15 minutes. And now it's an antigen test, which uh, is very, very important to know. As we plan our budget for the 21-22 school year, it continues to change. You just saw Ms. Wood's presentation about now ESSER 3 is coming in. There's still more coming. There's going to be uh, more money coming in terms of preschool especially and early literacy. And so those things you get the budget, the next thing you know, you got to change it again. We'll be bringing you another budget revision in May as a result of uh, changes to the virtual learning. Um, but at as we put all this together and beginning to get a good picture of what's happening, we want to be really hopeful that the legislature doesn't change anything. But at the next board meeting, this board meeting, actually, I'm recommending that all returning staff come back at current salary. So we had identified positions possibly for reduction to meet the lost student enrollment that you saw in Vindy's um, presentation. We don't need to do that. We can use COVID money for doing what's called recovery of lost, of lost positions according to ADM. So we're gonna be offering contracts to everyone. They won't guarantee you'll be doing the same thing if you were in that place where we were looking closely at that position, but you will be definitely working with kids. You will definitely be academic tutors, and uh, technology coaches, all those kinds of things we're gonna put in place. So that's our la that's that latest stimulus package. And so um, as I always uh, enjoy when Jeannie says she lives in six years of budgeting, what a, a mind boggling thing 
if you've ever done budgeting. I don't even do my home budget that way. So we have an opportunity here to envision a new educational system in the days to come. And that's what we want to look at and make work for our kids. And so we will keep looking at that direction and keep informed as the impact unfolds. And again, I apologize. It changes daily and we're prepared to pivot and move in that direction as, as the funding is, is detailed to us. So thank you very much. All oh, right, thank I'm you. Sorry, I forgot one thing. I no. didn't forget. I, I didn't realize. We have a young man who is our director of maintenance, Mr. Cody Chischilli. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things you and I have talked about is how we're dealing with facilities and facility needs. And um, I had a meeting the other day with Mr. Chischilli and the maintenance director and his, and, you know, he's had a staff behind him, but he has written an SFB grant uh, that has been approved to do the uh, address the, the bleachers in the large gym at a cost of 660,000 and the bleachers in the small gym at a cost of 320,000. So basically $980,000 from the SFB that we don't have to pay taxes to our, you know, from our community and draw taxes from. Uh, that's one. Uh, he's got, it's in the assessment phase um, uh, and that's Lakeview Roofing and uh, looking at the Lakeview Re Reservations weatherization, that's what it's called. And that's in the, the assessment phase. So it's, the concept's been approved. Now they send in a person to evaluate that assessment and tell and then estimate what it's going to cost. And then we start going through the process. But one that I'm really proud that it's in the uh, drawing phase now, it's actually in the design phase, <clears throat> is the high school roofing and weatherization. And that encompasses all the buildings right here that have students in them, doesn't do the district office or um, support services. But it's in design stage, it's already out there. Um, that's going to be a, a, an income to the district of 3.1, right now at $3.4 million. And again, that means we don't have to go look for tax dollars to raise that, that's coming from the school facilities board, which is tax dollars, of course, but 3.4 million, $900,000. This guy has got the pathway to the school facilities board lined out. And we've added some more possibilities for what he's doing, but I am so proud to be able to say to our community, hey, we're saving you lots and lots of money here because we're using resources at the state level and not having to tax our local community. Apologize for that, thank you. No, no, thank you. That is well worth uh, the apology, I guess. How's that? But Cody, uh, way, to, way to go. And uh, like I said, that, that's huge for the district. A uh, lot, of, lot of dollars that uh, we have been needing to find. And uh, he did a great job of finding that through the SFB. So appreciate that very much. Thank you, Superintendent Wallen. All right, let's go ahead and move on. No unfinished business. Uh, governing board consent agenda. Uh, uh, Desiree, do you have the statement, please? A copy of the consent agenda is available at the district administration office. All items listed will be considered as a unit by the governing board and will be approved with one motion. There will not be a separate discussion of these items unless a board member requests, in which case the item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered as a separate item. Okay. Uh I'll, I'll need a motion to consider the consent agenda and a second. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Okay, and moving on, uh, we're at, I believe, calendar of events. And uh, you have one in front of you, I believe. And uh, so any, uh, any additional things you'd like to highlight for the district or as we move on, heck, we've got graduations coming up uh, in a little over a month. So quickly moving on to that time of year. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our additional agenda items. Uh, the uh, first one is uh, item A, revision number two to the annual expenditure budget for 2020-2021. Uh, and this is an action item. Uh, need a motion and a second to approve. I make a motion to approve the second budget revision to the annual expenditure budget for the 2020 through 2021 school year. 
I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, thank you. Um, and then uh, next up item uh, B, the PUSD medical benefits package for 2021-2022 as explained by uh, Dr. Maurer. This is an action item. I need a motion and a second. I make a motion we approve the district moving to the classic gold and value gold plans for the 2021-2022 school year. And that was option three, I believe, in our presentation. Okay, we have a motion. Do I, I need a second? I'll second, second that motion. motion. Okay, very, very good. Any uh, comments, Dr. Maurer, uh, Superintendent Wallen? So governing board president, um, members of the governing board, I, I, I want to just reiterate the idea that uh, that option, option three, although it does require some um, plan design changes, uh, when we think about option one and we think about option two, uh, the unintended consequence of, of those first two options will be the uh, idea of the benefits, the individuals who come off the gold will go on to silver and then all of a sudden that cost will, will have to be incurred by that employee. So, so really with the plan design change in option three, as I, as I talked about, that cost for our employees, when it includes the spouses and includes children, will still be relegated to, to, to very minimal. Uh, so we wouldn't see, uh, as Mr. Wallen had talked about, uh, employees coming back at the same rate, we, we wouldn't see the, the amount of paycheck go down so substantially because, and still have a very robust benefit plan. Uh, that would be uh, uh, the option there, option three, so. Okay, thank you, Dr. Maurer. Any other comments, board members, Superintendent Wallen? Okay, all right, we got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, the item C is dissolution of district ACES program. Uh, this is discussion only at this point. Yes, it's just to bring this to the board's attention, Mr. President. Uh, yes, over the course of the COVID, you know, we haven't had the need for this and the staff in there are working mostly at Manson Mesa and are right. doing a tremendous job. And so with the new safe schools program, and the realignment of social emotional learning, we don't feel that this program is needed any longer in the district. So just to let you know that since the, I think the board was the one who generated it, uh, it's going away now. So we'll be revising and working with the safe schools uh, threat coordinator and social emotional learning coordinator and all the counselors and everybody to redesign what that looks like. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just a comment or a comment or question. I know with the PBIS, we always talked about the a restoration piece of that. And uh, we went to kind of a mitigation of ACEs. And now, so my expectation is that we're going to see a little more robust program for the kids, uh, wrap them in to where it's going to be uh, kind of fulfilling our PBIS goals. Correct. That's still a main part of that, of that program. Yes. Of the whole safe schools revamping. Right. Right. Multi system, multi-tiered system of, of support. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I any, have a qu any question? question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I do. Go, go, go. So, can I ask why we're not working with middle school at this point, and it's just only Mansa Mesa with the ACES program? No, that's just where the staff were reassigned uh, back in August when we didn't have, you know, didn't have any any uh, students in there. There was no reason for them to sit over in that building, and so that's where my need was at that point. And uh, they have just been excelling. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fowler. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I have a comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, part of that discussion, and I was going to list that later as a future agenda item, is I would like us to also look at um, uh, what we do when it comes to students' expulsions, because we have, I think, huge opportunity here that, like I've seen lately, that when kids are expelled right now, they're going to they're expelled into virtual learning, not expelled out of school. And so I was hoping that we could have that discussion as well, because one of the worst things I feel like I have to do as a school board member 
is expel a student. And um, because it limits their um, opportunities, educational opportunities. And I know that I've said in many of those and we always struggle with that and we always try to do whatever we can to um, lessen the impact of that. So if that could be part of the discussion, what can we do there, you know, when school students misbehave on campus, can we um, help them or move them into virtual or what can we do to make sure that we don't completely lose them, but, and that they don't completely lose their educational opportunities. I would just like us to discuss that as well. I've added that to the May 25th uh, okay. work study session for discussion. Thank you. Okay, I, uh, if I could also add to um, Sandra's comment um, regarding maybe perhaps on the next work study session as well, um, uh, I guess it would be like behavioral health needs for students and behavioral health education as far as students learning and understanding, um, you know, uh, um, drugs and alcohol, for example, right? You know, education on the, on that maybe, as well as, um, you know, expectations and disciplinary actions and, you know, having an understanding on that maybe as far as education-wise goes. Next work study st session. Okay, thank you, Mr. Weiss. Any other comments? Okay, let's go ahead and go on to item D, Assistant Principal Lakeview Elementary, uh, Superintendent Wallen. Uh, this is gonna be an action item. We'll need a motion in a second. I make a motion. It's for the hiring of? Uh, for the hiring of uh, um, Assistant Principal at Lakeview. Yep. So you want to continue your motion? So that is your motion. You, you uh, uh, want that approved. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I misunderstood. I apologize. Uh, we'll need a second for that motion. Someone with second? Okay, I'm, I'm, am I not hearing a second? Okay, at this point, not hearing a second, we will not move, move on that action at this point. Okay, um, let's see, item E, uh, job descriptions and contract information for the director of athletics and events, athletic activities and event clerk and cultural arts building supervisor, this is an action item. I need a motion and a second to consider. Do I have a motion? Andre, you need to unmute, sorry. Okay, here we go. I'm, I'm full screen on my board docs and I couldn't find my unmute button on my screen. I apologize. Um, can you hear me now? Sure can. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion to approve the job. Okay. Hold on. I make a motion to approve the job descriptions. Sorry. For and contract information for the director of athletics and events, athletic activities and event clerk and cultural arts. And here's where I'd like to change the motion cultural arts um, assistant, not supervisor. Okay, we do have a motion with the change noted. I'll need a second. I'll make a motion, I'll second that motion. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent Wallen. Uh, thank you, members of the board and board president. This is what we discussed in our April information session to expand our use of our facilities instead of 
taking the criticism that we have too much, we're gonna create activities that's gonna fill the facilities with the music program, the CAB, with the activities programs. We want to, once the board, now that the board has considered this, if you approve it, then we're gonna be moving, reaching out to the, to the um, a city and beginning to coordinate a variety of activities that we can begin to use. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so do I understand this correctly that that is now going to be under the superintendent supervision? Yes. And well, so it's first. so basically you're removing all that and putting it under you rather than having the supervisors be at the individual sites? Well, no, they'll stay at their individual sites. They don't But, you know, but how are they person. coded? How are they going to be coded under the superintendent board? Uh, that was in the package that was well, that's what I'm reading. I just want to make sure that yeah. that's correct. That's correct. They're, okay. they're coded that way, yes. So if we were to draw up a visual organizational chart, they would be straight under you, correct? That would be one of the groups under me, yes. Yes, one of okay. The that's, I just want to make sure that yeah. I read that right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks you, Ms. Sid Ms. Kidman. Uh, anybody else? Comments? Okay, so we have a motion. We do have a second. Uh, we'll, I'll call for the vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, item number F uh, is retiree contract form for 2021-2022. It's an action item. Motion and a second, please. recommend that we approve the revised form of retiree contracts for 2021-22. I second that motion. Okay. We do have a motion and a second. And uh, Dr. Maurer, please. Governing Board President, Governing Board members, and Superintendent Wallen, guests and colleagues. Uh, this was an oversight uh, through a conversation with Superintendent Wallen and in our recruitment plan. Uh, when we originally talked through the idea of the retirees' contracts, uh, it was noted that we did not offer benefits to retirees who return back to work for PUSD. Uh, when I go back and look, uh, this was a cost savings measure that was put into the district uh, probably a decade plus ago. Um, and it just, it just doesn't make sense uh, to, to not offer health benefits to a return to work employee uh, who may be retired. Uh, we have plenty of retired teachers in our, in our uh, MITS and PAGE and LACHI and around in our chapters who benefits would be a drawing uh, factor for them to come back to work for PAGE. Uh, so by taking this out, it provides us another recruiting tool uh, for retired individuals to come back and teach and work for us. Okay. Any uh, questions, folks? Yes. Okay. Can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so does it say in that contract that they don't have the same protections as, or is that covered by law that as they cannot incur tenure? So that is correct. So the, the retired ASRS employee who returns to work uh, has a different set of rules uh, from the state that they have to abide by. And that's the language that's in that contract. It's not in number one, um, okay. second sentence. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other comments, board members? Okay, thank you very much. We do have a motion and a second for the retiree contract. I mean, for the uh, yeah retiree contract. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you. Next item, a special. I'm I'm asking for a, a special meeting date um, to. Um, consider a grievance and again I, I I'll, I'll beg that I need some time to uh, get some advice as well so we take a look at that grievance and I had Lynn send some uh, regulations and policies to you so I'd like to look at a meeting date sometime in the next week or so if that's possible uh, so uh, so the action item would be to set a, uh, uh, a time for the meeting a date for the meeting. 
Do you have a suggestion for that meeting, like a date and time already? Yeah, I was I was trying to look at a Monday if that's possible. Monday or early next week sometime. Uh, yeah, I think we, we do need to look at a day next week. Yeah. Um, is this coming Thursday not? Um, is that not enough time for you to get ready? I I can I can. It's can you guys? I just wanted to make sure we had time to to uh, look at the look at the information and that kind of thing. So if if Thursday oh. will we'll work for everybody, uh, or, then Lynn will, let will give us all the proper information, and then we would look at Thursday at uh, is if five o'clock works. Okay, so. Thursday I have a conflict on Monday, but I can do Tuesday or Thursday this week. And I don't, Mr. Wallen won't be here Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Oh, I so, see. Oh. But you said Tuesday of next week, Sandra? Yeah, I can do, I, I would prefer Tuesday at our regular time if we can. Or if that's too late, I mean. I don't know. No, it's not. We can, no. we can oh, do okay. that. So I have a meeting at 5.30 on Tuesday for AS or ASBA, but um, if our meeting, if you don't mind me leaving early, I'm good on for next Tuesday. Okay, Ms. D, are you okay with that? Yes, I am. And uh, Mr. Weiss? I'm good, yeah, I can. Okay, so uh, doing this a little bit backwards, I apologize for that, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, and just uh, somebody make the motion we do that, and then we'll proceed. I make a motion that we schedule a special meeting on Tuesday, the 20th at 5 p.m. I second. second Sandra's motion. Okay, and we've had, the, like I said, a little bit backwards from Robert's rules of orders, but I am Robert, so there you go. Uh, all <laughs> okay. in... All, all in <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't. It's getting it's it's getting too long. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Sandra, that's next Tuesday, right? Yeah, Tuesday, that's April twentieth, five p.m. I believe, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we just have an item uh, to close out a COVID update, uh, Superintendent Wallen. Thank you, Mr. President. Um. Just a quick update. Uh, I already talked about Mr. Jones getting the COVID-19 testing available for our employees. And if you're watching the news, you can see that the opportunities for uh, adolescents to test is coming around the corner. And so uh, once we get permission slips designed and properly in place, we could use that as well, as long as the parents agree. Right now, the COVID update, Coconino County Community Transmission Classification has moved to moderate based on the, the um, HDHS benchmarks. The incident race, rate is moderate at 86.9 cases per 100,000 percent. Positivity is minimal at 3.7% and COVID-like illness is minimal at 1.2%. Uh, and so I believe for Paige, that's about two people uh, when we narrow the data down. So we're doing quite well. We are continuing our mitigation efforts. Um, but also want to be alert to the fact that there, nationally there has been a trend of an increase in adolescents um, uh, showing signs of COVID. And so we're, we're continuing to stay on top of that. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, that's all we've got then on the COVID? Yes. All right, last item, uh, future agenda items. We've, you've had a little bit of discussion now that you can see what's on the schedule for our, our next uh, work study session. Uh, so uh, if you have something else that you'd like to see on that, uh, let's get with me or Lynn and we can go about it. Uh, can you mention some now? Or yeah, absolutely. Next? Yeah, go ahead. If you have something on your mind, okay. do it now. Yes. Because I have a laundry list. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> no, don't apologize. Get it okay. done. You're, you're wasting okay. time, kid. For me? <laughs> yeah. No, we can discuss when the best time is. Um but okay. there's a few things I would like on future agenda items. One, um, a tax credit report for 2020. Mm -hmm. um, at least in form of some, you know, maybe it doesn't need to be an agenda item. Maybe it can just be um, a report or an email sent to us. But I would like that kind of, I kind of want to get that on the yearly thing that we have that tax credit report. 
Um, then also, um, I would like to discuss what we're, how we're going to address promoting kids this year slash skipping grades. I would just like some information how that's going to be handled. So that's two. Um, number three, I would, I want to make sure that we have a turnover report this um when is it? Like in July, August? Is that when we usually do it? We usually do it in September. September. So is that on the list to happen or do I have to request that every year? That's on the list. Okay. So, okay. Um, we already discussed the ACES. And then I would like to have an agenda item where we, since part of the, um, since we changed our top descriptions and um, in how we do um, athletics and special events. I was wondering if we could have a discussion on to um, mindfully have an organized approach on how we celebrate our students' um, achievements, academic, extracurricular, and any other kind of achievements. And then my last item, um, years ago, we used to have um, staff surveys and I haven't seen those in a few years. And I would like to either resurrect those or find a new way of doing it or having a 360 or something. Maybe we can discuss that. Um, so we can have a pulse on the district like we used to do. And somehow that just kind of went away. I don't know why, but I'd like to see that again. Okay. That's all I had. Appreciate that, Sandra. Thank you very much. And. Uh... Yeah, and added to one of those would be just the, uh, because we, I think we do get a survey of employees that are leaving, and I'd That's like to see. That's the turnover report. Yeah. Right, I'd like to see that, uh, you know. Oh, with exit data, I guess. Yeah, it's exit data, yeah. And the, and the exit data usually is, I believe, included in the turnover yeah. report. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, is, good. Are you okay with that being yeah, in that? Fine. That's okay. fine, yeah, yeah. Okay. But we may want to bring that as a conversation just to bring it up to everybody's attention. So, okay. Sounds very, very good. Anything else future? Okay. If not, we're near, I'm going to ask for an adjournment and a second to that action item in a second, please. I make, make a, a motion, motion to adjourn the meeting uh, at 721. Nice job. I uh, second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. And we're going to take a five minute break. We do have another meeting. It's a special meeting. Uh, and let's take a five minute break before we start.